Paul Revere's Ride. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, If the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land, two by sea. And I and the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night, and with muffled oars silently rowed to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend, through alley and street, wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed to the tower of the old north church, by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread, to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch, on the somber rafters that round him made masses, and moving shapes of shade, by the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall. Where he paused to listen and look down, a moment on the roofs of the town, and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind, as it went creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, All is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place in the hour, and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something, far away where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now gazed at the landscape far and near. Then, impetuous, stamped the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth, but mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo, as he looks, on the belfry's height a glimmer, and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes, till full on his sight a second lamp, and the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a book in the dark, and beneath, from the pebbles, in its passing, a spark struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all. And yet through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night. And the sparks struck out by that steed in his flight, kindled the lamb into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him tranquil and broad and deep is the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock, when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock, and felt the barfing, barking of the bar farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock, when he galloped into Lexington, he saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gazed at him with a spectral glare as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord Town. He heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of the birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead.
pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest. In the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall. Chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So, through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm. A cry of defiance, not of fear. A voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For, born on the night wind of the past, through all our history, to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will awaken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. Now, this poem is considered one of the first to capture a moment in the history of the American Revolution at length, considered literature by itself. There was some symbolism here, uh, a little bit in the, uh, but it's mostly a straight, read as a straightforward document. Symbolism, of course, being Revere himself and what the message he carried and the fate of the nation. He was aggrandized by Longfellow, and this is what made Paul Revere a national symbol of patriotism and of the American Revolution for a good 150 years after this poem was created. You need to read it, you need to imagine it, before you actually see the pictures. Because seeing it in your mind is a great adventure and something entirely different than the pictures put on the page. While impressive, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere is something you have to experience through your imagination first. Check it out, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. You can use the illustrations by Ted Rand, but like I said, I would just read it first and create that picture in your mind. Have a great day.